When a serious crime occurs, investigators often look into the personal life of the victim to understand their lives better. Oftentimes, these investigations can lead investigators into some of the most bizarre plot twists in true crime history. Number 15. Two would-be bank robbers found their plans foiled in more ways than one in April of 2016. These two bank robbers would go viral thanks to the CCTV footage that helped put them behind bars. At the beginning of April 2016, police and guards on duty in Praia Grande received an alert on the CCTV cameras. As they ran to the monitors, they saw two men trying to gain entry into the bank's vault, but something about them gave police officers a giggle. Inside the vault, two men were seen moving around, attempting to steal various items, but they had taken extra measures to ensure that they would not be caught. While the alarms on the vault didn't sound, the cameras did pick the men up and that's thanks to the tin foil that the men wrapped themselves in. The bank robbers believed that their tin foil disguises would shield them from the alarms and make them almost invisible to guards. Unfortunately for the men, their clever disguises didn't work and after CCTV cameras captured their movements, armed police and guards moved in to capture them. The two men were arrested days later and their bizarre bank heist went viral for all the wrong reasons. Number 14. In March of 2011, 19-year-old Shania Huber's phone pinged with a notification from the infamous website Facebook. As she checked her phone, she saw she had a friend request from 28-year-old Ryan Poston. She was immediately smitten by his good looks and over the next few hours, the two began chatting back and forth. As hours turned into days, the two quickly formed a relationship, but not everything was as it seemed between Ryan and Shania. Just a year and a half later, tragedy would strike, leaving Shania and Ryan in the middle of an unbelievable twist. Shortly after accepting Ryan's friend request, the two began to message back and forth, and immediately found themselves attracted to one another. Ryan had just broken off a long-term relationship and was looking for something more casual, but according to Ryan's friends, Shania was obsessed. Shania's friends would later tell investigators that Ryan was cold and cruel towards her. Just months into their blossoming relationship, Ryan tried to gently break things off with Shania, but she was smitten. She began turning up at his apartment and his workplace, begging him to stay with her and work on their relationship. She would allegedly text him between 50 and 100 times a day, and as the months went on, their relationship soured even further. On October 12, 2012, Ryan was getting ready to head out on a date with another woman when an angry Shania showed up at his apartment. What happened next would go on to shock the state of Kentucky. According to Shania, she pulled out her firearm and discharged it six times in self-defense after the pair had argued. During her interrogation, she admitted to the crime but maintained that she had acted in self-defense. Her bizarre behavior and speech were captured by CCTV and were later shown in court. With the confession and evidence, police knew that they had a solid case against Shania, but what would happen next would leave them shocked. In 2015, Shania's case went to trial after the state of Kentucky had spent years building a case against her. CCTV from her interrogation, along with digital and forensic evidence, was submitted and the jury returned their verdict of guilty. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 20, but Shania's defense team found one flaw with the entire proceedings. An unnamed juror who had served on the panel had failed to disclose that they had a felony. According to reports, the felony stemmed from 20 years of unpaid child support that the person in question was not aware that they owed. As a result, Shania was granted a new trial with a new jury who were made to disclose any criminal charges against them. Despite the hitch in proceedings, this new jury also found Shania guilty and withheld her sentence of 40 years. Shania Hubert is currently being held in the Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women and will be eligible for parole in 2032. Number 13. One chilly September evening, 68-year-old Agneta Westland left her home in Sweden to take the family dog for a walk. She said goodbye to her husband, Ingemar, and headed out of the house for what would be the last time. 
After a long period had passed and Agneta and her dog had failed to return, Ingemar went out looking for them, fearing that they had become injured. What he would come across would be much worse and send Ingemar on a desperate hunt to exonerate his name. As Ingemar retraced the route that his wife usually took, his path took him to a lake close to the village. As he approached, he saw the body of his wife on the ground. He called out to her, but she was motionless. In a panic, Ingemar ran to the nearest house to call for help, and police swiftly arrived at the scene. It was clear that Agneta had been attacked, and in the eyes of the police, there was only one suspect, Ingemar. He was arrested and taken to prison while the case could be further investigated. Ingemar maintained his innocence, but in the initial hours of the investigation, the police believed that he had planned the entire stunt to make it appear random. Agneta's body had also been found in a remote area close to the village, and Ingemar was the only one who knew that she would be out there that evening. Weeks passed and Ingemar was allowed to attend his wife's funeral, all while family members and villagers looked on in horror, believing that he was the one to blame. It wasn't until six months after Agneta passed that the truth was finally revealed, and it would become one of the most shocking plot twists in true crime history. In March of 2009, the Swedish police announced that Ingemar had not been responsible for what had happened to his wife. In a shocking twist, they revealed to the public that genetic testing on Agneta's wounds and body led them to a European elk. At first, the animal fibers were believed to have belonged to the family dog, but thanks to eagle-eyed technicians, the fibers were retested. Investigators believed that Agneta came across the elk on her evening walk with her dog, and that the elk may have ingested fermented apples from the nearby forests. As it does with humans, the alcoholic content of the apples affected the elk's behavior, and it's believed that Agneta's dog possibly riled it up while trying to defend her. Ingemar had not been made aware that he had been exonerated until after the police released this finding. Ingemar would go on to sue the police department for detaining him and causing him distress. Number 12 On November 26, 2008, hikers in the Yakima Reservation close to White Swan in Washington came across skeletal remains. Shocked by what they had discovered, they ran to the nearest house to call the Yakima National Tribal Police to the scene. The tribal police, along with the coroner, soon arrived at the scene and began investigating the matter. The coroner determined that the remains belonged to a Native American woman, and due to the state of the remains, no further details could be discerned. The coroner was unable to determine how or why she had ended up there, and postulated that she had possibly met with foul play. The Yakima Nation Tribal Police worked with the local community on the Yakima Reservation to identify the unknown woman However, nothing ever came of this. Posters and alerts were put up around the reservation, but without a composite sketch, nobody ever came forward to claim her. Due to the state of her remains, investigators were doubtful as to whether they would be able to identify her. However, that's where Othram stepped in. In 2022, Othram worked with the Yakima County Coroner's Office to obtain a DNA sample from the discovered remains. From here, they were able to create a bigger profile and dig into the woman's family tree. After narrowing it down to one person, the family was contacted and asked to provide a comparative DNA sample. Finally, in January of 2023, Othram, the Yakima County Coroner's Office, and the Yakima Nation Tribal Police announced that the remains had been identified as 29-year-old Daisy May Heath Nitalma, who had grown up in the area where she was discovered. Daisy had been traveling between the Yakima Reservation and the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon at the time of her disappearance. According to her family, it wasn't unusual for her to be gone for long periods. However, she was finally reported missing on October 29, 1987, when her family realized that she had not been seen or heard from in several months. Shortly after she disappeared, her backpack, keys, and a turquoise ring that she often wore were found in a remote area of the reservation which is only accessible to tribal citizens or those with permission. Daisy's sister, Patricia Whitefoot, 
told investigators that at the time of her disappearance, she was very vulnerable but knew how to look after herself outdoors. Daisy had lived and grown up around White Swan, and it was also here that she was reported missing. Her family and the community now want to know how her missing person case was never cross-referenced when the remains were discovered in 2008. Daisy's sister, Patricia, told the Yakima Herald Republic, quote, I want to get the story of my sister out there, other than the fact she's missing. She was a good person. She was looked to in a very positive light by her sisters and family members and nieces and nephews she helped raise. Number 11. On September 13, 2014, 18-year-old Hannah Graham stepped out of her dormitory at the University of Virginia and headed out for a night of partying and drinking with her friends. Hannah, who had been born in the UK, had moved to the US to attend college, and she was excited for what her academic career had in store for her. What should have been a night of socializing ended up turning into every parent's worst nightmare when Hannah failed to return home to the safety of her dorm. That evening, Hannah visited several bars and parties around the University of Virginia campus. At around 1.20 a.m., she sent a text to a friend letting them know that she was on her way to the party they were at, but had gotten lost. This would be the last time Hannah was ever seen or heard from again, and the authorities were alerted to her disappearance the next morning. Her friends and family knew that something was wrong and that Hannah would not have voluntarily walked away from her life. Investigators immediately began searching close to the University of Virginia when they came across CCTV footage of Hannah's last moments. The video showed Hannah walking through the Charlottesville area at around 12.45 a.m., and behind her was a mysterious man that investigators were keen to talk to. When they retraced her steps, investigators discovered she'd spent some of the night at a bar named Tempo and that she had been in the company of an unknown man. Witnesses would later confirm that they saw Hannah at the bar that night in the company of 32-year-old Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr. Other witnesses in the area that evening recalled seeing Hannah walking through Charlottesville where she was captured on CCTV and that LJ was shortly behind. Another witness would later testify that he saw Hannah standing by an orange car, telling AJ that she didn't want to get into the car with him. This is believed to have been the last time Hannah was ever seen alive. The search would continue for weeks with the Charlottesville police combing through the university campus and surrounding bars. Unfortunately, on October 18, 2014, the search came to a tragic end when Hannah's body was discovered in a remote area of the county. Investigators would later discover footage of Hannah and LJ on the night that she disappeared that showed LJ approaching Hannah and putting his arm around her. In late 2014, Jesse Leroy Matthew Jr. was arrested and charged with taking Hannah's life. After his arrest, it was also discovered that LJ had been involved in other similar crimes in the area and that other court cases against him were pending. After two long years of heartache, Hannah's family finally received closure in 2016 when LJ pled guilty. At the time of the trial, he was already serving three life terms for similar crimes he had committed in 2005, and the judge added an additional life term for Hannah's case. Number 10. On October 10, 1984, the residents of South Pasadena, California, would learn that a fire had swept through the Olds Home Center hardware store at the local mall. The fire had started seemingly out of nowhere and was blazing with fierce intent within five to ten minutes. As employees and shoppers rushed out of the store, not all of them made it out alive. Unfortunately, the lives of four people were taken due to the fire, and the lives of countless others were on the line due to smoke inhalation and other injuries. Within a matter of minutes, the Los Angeles Fire Department arrived at the scene to save the day. But little did everyone know that lurking behind the facade of a firefighter was a madman. The fire at Ohl's Home Center shocked the community of South Pasadena. It had happened so quickly and almost out of nowhere. Forensic fire experts from around Los Angeles were called to the scene to carry out an analysis and determine the cause. John Leonard Orr, 
A well-seasoned firefighter and a forensic fire investigator was amongst them. While all of the other officials concluded that the fire had been a tragic accident due to an electrical fault somewhere within the building, John thought differently. He was the first and only one to speculate that the fire had been set intentionally. Over the next few years, Los Angeles would experience a spike in arsons, sending alarm bells ringing in the ears of forensic fire investigators. These fires were being perpetrated by one person who used a homemade device made from a lit cigarette, some matches, and pillowcases. The pillowcases would act as the perfect fuel for the fire, spreading it to whatever surrounded it. While this device was crudely made, it signaled to investigators that the person responsible clearly had malicious intent and knew enough about fire and fire spread. By 1987, concern had grown amongst forensic fire investigators in Los Angeles, and they decided to hold a conference. During the conference, it appeared that they were being watched by the now-called Pillow Pyro, who retaliated by setting more fires across Los Angeles. At one of the crime scenes, investigators discovered a fingerprint and hoped it would finally lead them to their man. Unfortunately, the fingerprint was not enough to bring the person to justice. However, it did help the investigators narrow down their pool of suspects, and it included one of their own, John Leonard Orr. In a bid to gain more evidence, a tracking device was placed on John's car, and finally, by late 1991, the Los Angeles Police Department had enough evidence to bring about a conviction against John Leonard Orr. Throughout the many years that he had been active, he'd also actively been investigating himself and was the only person to insist that the 1984 fire was intentional. At his trial, John Leonard Orr was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years without the possibility of parole in lieu of capital punishment. After John's arrest, he was also found to have written a book called Points of Origin, in which the protagonist's crimes eerily mirrored his own. Number 9 38-year-old Suzanne Pilly of Scotland was known as a loving and caring woman who had close ties with her family. In 2010, Suzanne was working as a bookkeeper at Infrastructure Management and her colleagues regarded her as a hardworking and punctual employee. So when she failed to show up to work one morning, they knew something was very wrong. When 9 a.m. arrived on May 4, 2010, and there was no sign of Suzanne at her desk, her manager immediately notified her family. Her parents, Robin and Sylvia, were shocked to be hearing from Suzanne's workplace, especially so early in the morning. After speaking to her parents, it was discovered that the last time anyone had had contact with Suzanne was at around 8.30 a.m. via text. Unable to get a hold of their daughter, Robin and Sylvia dialed 999 and reported their daughter missing. Within hours, the office where she worked was teeming with investigators, looking for any clues as to what could have possibly happened to her. It was determined via texts and information from Suzanne's parents that she left for work as usual that morning. Investigators slowly began to retrace Suzanne's steps to work and discovered CCTV footage of her at a local Sainsbury supermarket at 8.51 a.m. By 8.54 a.m., she left Sainsbury's and was seemingly on her way to work, only she never made it. The police now knew that whatever happened to Suzanne happened in that narrow frame of time right outside the building where she worked, but who could be responsible? While talking to Suzanne's co-workers, they discovered that she had previously had an affair with David Gilroy, a fellow employee who was married with children. The two had allegedly broken off the affair in late 2009, and Suzanne was now reportedly seeing other people. For police in Scotland, the name David Gilroy left a foul taste in their mouths and he would become their primary suspect. In the weeks and months after Suzanne disappeared, police in Scotland launched several appeals, including public billboards and TV appearances to gain information on Suzanne's whereabouts, but nothing ever came of it. Suzanne's friends and family watched on as the police continued their investigation. And then, in June of 2010, Police Scotland would announce that David Gilroy had been arrested in connection with Suzanne's disappearance. According to forensic experts, cadaver dogs alerted several areas in the office's base, 
and in the trunk of David Gilroy's car. While Suzanne's body still hadn't been discovered, the prosecution believed that they had enough evidence against David to take him to trial. During David's trial, the prosecution revealed CCTV evidence of David and Suzanne at the local supermarket, just two days before she disappeared. Another witness would later confirm that Suzanne had been trying to break off the relationship with David, but that he was obsessed with her. CCTV footage also showed David moving in and out of the office's basement on the day that Suzanne disappeared, and his workplace confirmed that while he had arrived by bus that morning, he left midday to collect his car. The prosecution would also bring to light more CCTV footage of David's movements in the days after Suzanne's disappearance. On May 5th, he drove from Edinburgh to Argyle around 130 miles away and on his way back was noted to have taken a more rural route. According to the BBC, David's phone had been switched off while he was away, leading police to believe that he drove to a secluded location and disposed of Suzanne's body. His car had also shown signs of being driven through a forested area. In April of 2012, David Gilroy was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 18 years before he's eligible for parole. In the years since his arrest and conviction, David has attempted to file several appeals. However, none have ever been successful. Number 8. For decades, the women in Lafayette Parish, Louisiana, were left terrified by reports of a madman on the loose. As the years rolled by, more reports trickled in about an attacker who entered the homes of women at night and attacked them while they were most vulnerable. In their desperate time of need, the residents of Lafayette Parish looked towards their sheriff's department and other law enforcement agencies to keep them safe. But little did they know that the ones tasked to protect them were harboring a dark secret. In September of 1997, the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Department found itself inundated with reports from women across the country. All of these women detailed how their attacker had gained entry to their homes at night before assaulting them. By 1997, a few DNA samples had been obtained from some of the crime scenes and investigators hoped that these samples would finally put away their perpetrator once and for all. Along with DNA samples, investigators also had a composite sketch which bore an eerie resemblance to Sheriff Deputy Randy Como. Suspicion was slowly building against Randy, and his colleagues began to see him in a different light. For many years, he had been tasked with keeping the people of Lafayette safe, and even instructed women on how to defend their homes. He would often tell women which windows and doors to lock to protect themselves. Little did these women know that they were instructions from their would-be attacker. Without any hard evidence, the Lafayette police continued to investigate the case until they received a tip in 1998, telling them to look further into Randy Como. This tip prompted the police to obtain a DNA sample from a cigarette that Randy had discarded. At first, investigators believed that the tip was a vicious rumor. However, when the results came back, they were stunned. DNA testing confirmed that Randy Como was the attacker that they had been searching for. During his arrest, Randy confessed to being responsible for at least five crimes, although investigators believe that his victim count is much higher. For his crimes, Randy Como was sentenced to six life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 7 When Russ Feria met Betsy O'Fallon in Missouri in 1998, his entire life changed. From the moment the two began talking, they fell in love, and just two short years later, they were married. Betsy had two other children from a previous relationship, and Russ took them in as if they were his own. The Ferias were well known within their local community, and everyone looked forward to seeing them at church on Sunday. In 2010, Betsy would get a shocking diagnosis that would change the course of hers and Russ's life forever. In 2010, Betsy discovered that she had breast cancer and opted to have a mastectomy and treatment. For a while, Betsy's health recovered and the family were doing well. That was until 2011, when doctors discovered that the cancer had spread into other parts of her body and that it was mostly untreatable. The doctors who took care of Betsy had to deliver the heartbreaking news to both her and her husband that she would likely have just three to five years left to live. 
After this shocking news, Russ and Betsy ensured to create many happy memories together for when she was gone. Also by Betsy's side was her friend, Pamela Hupp. Pam and Betsy had met at work years before, and after hearing the tragic news, Pamela reached out. On December 27, 2011, Pamela took Betsy to an appointment at a nearby hospital. After her appointment was over, the two visited Betsy's mother before Pamela took Betsy home. When Russ arrived home hours later, he discovered a horrific sight. His beloved wife, Betsy, had been attacked and laid on the floor of their home. 911 was immediately called to the scene, but it was too late to save Betsy. Shortly after the ambulance arrived, so did the police, and they zeroed in on Russ as the person of interest. Russ maintained that he had a solid alibi for the evening of the crime, telling investigators that he'd been watching a film at a friend's house from 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. when he returned home and discovered his wife. Unfortunately, investigators did not believe Russ's story, which was later compounded when the coroner determined that the crime could have taken place between 7 p.m. and 9.40 p.m. Despite Russ's solid alibi and the fact that he had been spotted at Arby's on the evening of the crime around the time that it had taken place, Russ was taken to trial where he pleaded guilty to taking Betsy's life. His defense tried to argue his case and also tried to tell the jury about Pamela Hupp's strange behavior in the lead up to the crime, but it was suppressed. After months of arduous testimony, Russ Feria was sentenced to serve life plus 30 years. For the next three years, Russ found himself behind bars for a crime that he maintained he did not commit. Thankfully, his lawyer, Joel Schwartz, truly believed his client's innocence and had collected enough evidence to appeal. In 2015, Russ was granted a new trial with new evidence and the house of cards would slowly come falling around Pamela Hub. In the initial investigation, Joel Schwartz had discovered that in the days before her passing, Betsy's $150,000 life insurance policy had changed to pay out to Pamela. It was also discovered that Pamela's mother had passed away under mysterious circumstances, and she too was the recipient of her life insurance policy. While there wasn't enough evidence to convict Pamela just yet, Russ had his conviction overturned and began his long march for justice. Just a year later, Pamela would again find herself at the center of a criminal investigation when it was discovered that she'd tried to set up a robbery gone wrong and pin it on Russ Feria. She had lured in her victim, Louis Gumpenberger, under the pretense that they were filming for a TV show. She then attacked him and called 911, claiming that she had acted in self-defense when he had tried to steal Betsy's life insurance money. The story quickly fell around her and three years later, she was sentenced to life without parole. In 2021, another shocking development would transpire when Pamela Hupp was formally charged and arrested in connection with Betsy's case. Pamela, who had once been the star witness for the prosecution in Russ's case, now faced a similar fate, and she's currently being held on trial. Number 6. 34-year-old Nancy Titterton and her husband Louis Titterton lived in a comfortable and happy life in their East River, New York apartment. Nancy was a crime author who had recently landed a big book deal, and Louis was an executive at NBC. By 1936, the two were doing well in their respective jobs and looked forward to what the future held for them. Unfortunately, one April afternoon would change the course of Nancy's life forever and lead investigators on a hunt for justice. On April 10, 1936, two men, Theodore Kruger and John Fiorenza, arrived at the Titterton's apartment to deliver a sofa that had just been reupholstered. At first, the two men rang the doorbell and waited to be greeted by Nancy with further instructions. But as the minutes passed and there was no response, they noticed that the main door to the apartment complex was open. So they let themselves in and headed to Nancy's apartment. Once there, they also noticed that the apartment door had been left open and unlocked. Thinking that Nancy had simply done this to allow ease of access, the two entered the apartment and began setting down the sofa. Once their job was finished, they called Nancy but got no reply. As they moved around the apartment and neared the bathroom, they discovered Nancy's body in the bath. Shocked at what they had discovered, 
the two men ran to the nearest phone and called the police to the scene. When police arrived, John and Theodore immediately became their prime suspects. Theodore told investigators that he had a solid alibi for the morning of the crime, which was backed up by others at his workshop. John, however, did not have a solid alibi and the police were quick to zero in on him. During the forensic sweep of Nancy and Lewis's apartment, police discovered a 13-inch cord along with a single horsehair. In the 1930s, it was common for furniture to be stuffed using horsehair, and thanks to good old detective work, investigators were able to confirm that the company run by Theodore Kruger used the same type of horsehair when reupholstering Nancy's sofa. The police also contacted cord manufacturers in and around New York and discovered that the cord found near Nancy's body was identical to the cord that had been supplied to Theodore Kruger's business. As Theodore had a solid alibi, investigators went after the next possible suspect, John Fiorenza. John was brought in for questioning and after a few hours, he admitted responsibility. He told investigators that he'd met Nancy the day before when he had arrived to collect the sofa for reupholstery. She had asked that the job be carried out as quickly as possible, so when John arrived on the morning of April 10th, she was expecting him. However, John had arrived alone and without the sofa and confessed to Nancy that he had come to confess his feelings for her and that he believed the two had hit it off the day before. Nancy rejected John, telling him that she was happily married. Unfortunately, John did not take the rejection well and shortly after, he attacked Nancy. Thanks to the detective work by the New York Police Department, John Fiorenza was finally behind bars. John was taken to trial where he pled guilty and was sentenced to capital punishment, which was carried out at Sing Sing Prison in January of 1937. Number 5 84-year-old Angela Kleinsorge was regarded as a kind and peaceful woman in her community of San Diego, California. Angela lived alone at 5600 Gain Street and her children would ensure to check in on their mother daily. In February of 1992, a shocking crime would rock the Kleinsorge family and send the San Diego Police Department on a decade-long hunt for justice. On the morning of February 29, 1992, Hetty Kleinsorge called her mother's home as she did every morning, but on February 29th, there was no answer. Fearing that something was wrong, Hetty rushed over to her mother's home and saw that the blinds were down. As she moved around the home, she discovered her mother's body close to her bed. Shocked at what she had discovered, she ran to the nearest phone and called the San Diego police to the scene. A search of the crime scene showed that Angela's attacker had most likely gained entry through an open window before attacking her. There was very little evidence left behind at the scene of the crime. However, forensic investigators were able to retrieve some DNA. This evidence was submitted for testing. However, it did not match with anyone. Investigators hoped that new leads would come to light, but the case remained cold. That was until 2016, when the San Diego police decided to take another look at the case. By this time, Familial DNA was becoming a widespread practice across the US, and investigators hoped that it would finally lead them to the person responsible. After months of testing and hard work, investigators announced that they had discovered who had taken Angela's life 24 years earlier. DNA analysis led them to Jeffrey Falls, who had lived just across the road. Jeffrey passed away in 2006, and while justice may not be fully served, Angela's children are happy to finally have a conclusion to their mother's case. Number 4 Jennifer Pan had been a star student all of her life, at least that's what her parents thought. Her Vietnamese parents had immigrated to Toronto, Canada to give Jennifer a better life and from the start, they made it clear that academic success was very important. From an early age, Jennifer was pushed into playing the piano and ice skating as well as maintaining her A grades at school. Unfortunately, the pressure would prove too much for Jennifer and it would lead to disastrous consequences. November 8, 2010 started like any other for the Pan family. Jennifer, her father Hui Han, and Bi Ka got themselves up and ready for work. As evening approached, the family reunited in the home to eat together, not knowing what was about to happen. 
At around 10 p.m., two men made their way into the Pan home and snuck up on Hui Han and Bik Ha. The two men demanded money and led Hui, Jennifer, and Bik down into the basement where they were attacked. They also threatened to harm their daughter, Jennifer, if they did not comply. Once the attack was over, the two men left the Pan household and Jennifer immediately rushed to save her parents. Amid the struggle, Jennifer was able to retrieve her phone and call 911, summoning police to the scene. Unfortunately, Bik Ha, Jennifer's mother, did not survive, while Hui Han did. Jennifer also survived the attack, but investigators immediately became suspicious of her. It wasn't until days later that Hui Han told investigators that on the night that he'd been attacked, he recalled seeing his daughter speaking with one of the attackers. Multiple interviews later, investigators had finally pieced together the puzzle, and Jennifer Pan admitted to everything. Through tears, she admitted that she and her boyfriend, Daniel Wong, had set the entire thing up to get rid of her parents and to collect inheritance money. Most of Jennifer's life had been a lie, and she felt that the pressure of her parents was put on her too strong. In 2004, she told her parents that she'd been accepted into Ryerson Metropolitan University, but this was a lie. Jennifer had initially been offered a spot at the university, however, as her grades fell, the university withdrew its offer. During her final year of high school is when Jennifer met her boyfriend and partner in crime, Daniel Wong. Wong was said to have been a bad influence on Jennifer, and her grades immediately started to slip. To counteract this, Jennifer faked report cards and official letters from her school and university to keep up the appearances with her parents. In 2006, she told her parents that she was transferring to the University of Toronto, and that she had even obtained a scholarship. This was in fact another lie, and Jennifer went through the motions of having a fake graduation, telling her parents that there was only one ticket, so she gave it away. While her parents were dubious of Jennifer's success, they were still proud of her and pushed her to achieve more. Following her graduation, Jennifer claimed to have taken a role at the Toronto Children's Hospital, which was quickly discovered to be another lie. This time, her parents caught on to her deception and punished her severely for it. They also found out about Jennifer's boyfriend, Daniel, and began to doubt that she'd graduated from university as she had claimed. Once investigators had uncovered Jennifer's web of lies, the rest of the case fell into place. Daniel Wong, along with two co-conspirators, were arrested along with Jennifer Pan, and the four of them were taken to trial. For her involvement in the alleged hit on her parents' life, Jennifer Pan was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Daniel Wong, who's believed to have encouraged Jennifer's plan, also received life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 3. Abraham Shakespeare of Plant City, Florida, was known to be a gentle and kind man. He had left school in his early teens to help his family make ends meet, and ever since, he had found himself in an array of jobs. In 2006, Abraham's luck would change, and it would bring with it one of the most bizarre plot twists in true crime history. When Abraham and his friend Michael Ford stopped at a gas station on November 15th, 2006. Abraham had no idea it was about to be his lucky night. Abraham bought himself two lottery tickets, hoping and praying to get a windfall. That evening, Abraham watched the TV excitedly as the presenters read out the lottery numbers. At that moment, time stood still for Abraham. He looked down at his ticket and realized that he had just won $31 million. A mixture of shock and excitement washed over him as he ran to the phone to tell his family. Weeks later, Abraham had received his lottery winnings and cashed out $16.9 million. All that glitters is not gold, and Abraham would soon realize this. By 2008, Abraham had spent most of his money either on himself or his family. His family noticed that shortly after he had won the lottery, Abraham had gained a lot of new friends and he'd been warned not to trust them. Then Abraham met Doris D.D. D. Moore, who claimed to be an author who wanted to write a book about Abraham's life and winnings. Slowly over time, Dee Dee inserted herself into Abraham's personal life and became privy to his financial information. As Abraham had left school at a young age, Dee Dee knew that he was unable to read or write and offered to take care of his finances for him. Then in early 2009, Abraham simply dropped off the map. 
At first, his family were not too worried and figured that Abraham would contact them when he was ready. However, as the end of 2009 rolled around, panic began to set in. Abraham was eventually reported missing, and investigators began trawling through a long list of names, including all those he had ever lent money to. Several wide-scale searches were conducted for Abraham, but little came of it. That was until investigators began looking further into Dee Dee Moore and began digging in Plant City. In January of 2010, investigators finally discovered Abraham's body buried behind a home in Plant City. The case against Dee Dee Moore was slowly building and eventually Dee Dee Moore confessed that someone had taken Abraham's life. It would later transpire that Dee Dee enlisted the help of her ex-husband to create the hole in which Abraham was disposed of. When visited by investigators, Dee Dee first said that Abraham had gone out of town, but her story quickly fell apart. She also told investigators that she had bought Abraham's home from him, but this too appeared to be a lie. Investigators discovered that Dee Dee had been using Abraham's money for her own purposes and had even bought herself a $70,000 Corvette. In 2012, Dee Dee was found guilty of taking Abraham's life and was sentenced to life without parole. In a bizarre twist, Dee Dee became an avid campaigner for new legislation that would keep lottery winners' names private for 90 days after their winning. She told the media, quote, I don't feel that's enough time. You've got to understand this person has to change their whole life around. 90 days is nothing. You see how quick time flies. Dee Dee Moore has lodged several appeals against her sentence, but so far, none have been successful. Number 2 In 2012, Dave Krupa met Carrie Farver while she was working at a car repair shop in Omaha, Nebraska. The two seemed to have perfect chemistry right from the onset. But as Dave was in a professional setting, he thought it was inappropriate to make a move on a customer. Weeks later, he was overjoyed when he saw Carrie's profile on a dating website, and the two picked up where they had left off. At first, the two agreed that they weren't looking for anything serious. However, the more time they spent together, the more they fell for each other. When Dave's ex-girlfriend, Liz Golier, arrived at his apartment one night to collect her things, she was infuriated to see that he'd moved on to someone new. What would follow would become one of the most bizarre plot twists in true crime history. Liz and Dave had briefly been seeing each other, but Dave had broken it off after telling Liz that he wasn't looking for anything serious. At the time Liz arrived at Dave's apartment, Carrie was staying over for the week because of a big project at work, and staying at Dave's would cut her commute in half. On November 13, 2012, Carrie left Dave's apartment, telling him that she would see him later, but little did Dave know what was coming next. That afternoon, he received a bizarre text from Carrie, stating that she thought the couple should move in together. Dave was taken aback by this. The two had agreed to keep things at a steady pace, and he kindly put down her offer. Carrie immediately lashed out via text, stating that she hated him and that she was seeing someone new anyway. Over the next few months, Dave and his ex, Liz Golier, would be the recipients of a targeted harassment campaign. Carrie would send hundreds of texts to Dave and Liz threatening their lives. She also took it one step further and even began to stalk Dave and Liz at work, defacing their personal property. One evening, she even sent Dave a text message, telling him that she was outside of his apartment window and described to him what he was wearing and what he was watching on TV. Liz and Dave went to the police with the texts and emails, but there was little the police could do. Liz and Dave hoped that Carrie would eventually tire of harassing them, but the tirade continued. In early 2015, the case came to a head when Liz Goldier dialed 911 and reported that she had been attacked by one of Dave's ex-girlfriends, but it wasn't Carrie Farver. Liz claimed that her attacker had been Amy Flora, another one of Dave's ex-girlfriends who he shared two children with. Investigators now began to wonder whether Amy had been behind the campaign of harassment the entire time. But what investigators would uncover next would shock them. It turns out that Dave and Liz weren't the only ones worried about Carrie Farver. Her mother and son hadn't heard from her since November of 2012, when she abruptly announced she was moving from Iowa to Kansas and that she had quit her job. In one text message, she wrote, 
You can't either believe I'm your daughter, mother, sister, and friend that you know your whole life, or you can just leave me alone. I left of my own free will, and I'm sick of everyone giving me a hard time for doing what I needed to do. I'm a grown woman, and if I feel like leaving home, I have the right. When she stopped making contact with family, they tried to report her missing, but investigators were unable to find any leads and believed that Carrie had disappeared of her own volition. After the attack on Liz Golier, the web of lies slowly began to fall apart, and investigators soon realized who the real culprit was. Forensic analysis of the text messages and emails showed that they had originated from none other than Liz Golier. Investigators believe that Liz took Carrie's life in November of 2012, in a fit of rage after discovering she was with Dave. From there, she impersonated Carrie and stalked herself and Dave to make it look as though Carrie was a jilted lover. Investigators uncovered a key piece of evidence, a photograph of a body bearing the same distinctive tattoo as Carrie Farber. Finally, investigators were able to arrest Liz Golier on multiple charges, and she's currently serving a life sentence. Number 1 In 2004, Janelle Potter, along with her parents, Buddy and Barbara Potter, moved to Mountain City, Tennessee, looking for a new start. Janelle, now an adult, still lived at home due to ill health and found it difficult to socialize and make friends. After moving to her new home, Janelle became fast friends with Tracy Greenwell, and it appeared that things were looking up for Janelle. That was until one morning in January of 2012, when the entire house of cards fell down around Janelle. After Tracy and Janelle started their friendship, Tracy slowly began to introduce her to more people around Mountain City, and one of those was Billy Payne. Janelle was immediately attracted to Billy. However, he refused her advances and told her that he was in a happy relationship with Billy Jean Hayworth. Janelle was disheartened by the news, but when she met Tracy's cousin, Jamie Curd, she immediately perked back up and the two started a secretive romance. Janelle's parents heavily monitored her life and her social media accounts, so she and Jamie had to keep their relationship a secret. Shortly after the two got together, a campaign of harassment ensued against Billy and Billie Jean. Hundreds of messages a day from unknown users would appear and Billy and Billie Jean believed that they were being spread by Janelle because she was jealous. Janelle would also claim that she was being harassed and bullied by the two, and from there, the events spiraled. Things came to a head in January of 2012 when the bodies of Billy and Billie Jean were discovered in their homes. They had been attacked. When police arrived at the scene, they were stunned. A quick investigation into the lives of Billy and Billie Jean showed the long-standing animosity between them and Janelle Potter, and investigators worked their way out. Investigators were able to uncover evidence that proved Buddy, Janelle's father, and Jamie, Janelle's boyfriend, had been at the home of Billy and Billie Jean on the day of the crime. When interviewed, Buddy told investigators that he had been contacted by a man named Chris, who claimed to be a CIA agent who was tasked with protecting Janelle. He told Buddy, who also claimed to work for the CIA in the past, that he needed to act quickly to save his daughter's life. This included taking the lives of Billy and Billie Jean. When a digital forensic assessment of the emails from Chris was conducted, it was discovered that they had originated from Janelle's computer. The entire time, Janelle Potter had been behind the campaign of harassment and had fooled her parents into thinking that a CIA agent had been sent to help her. For their involvement in the crime, Janelle, Buddy, Barbara, and Jamie were arrested and charged accordingly. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.